first let me apologize for my hoarseness. We are still fighting pollen three and a half months into the battle down here in Atlanta. And so I'm, I'm a little hoarse, so please excuse that. Um, good afternoon. I'm Chilton Varner, uh, currently the president of the Supreme Court Historical Society. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you to the Society's 2022 annual lecture. While I wish we were doing this in, um, in person, uh, I think we all have to agree that doing it virtually broadens our audience substantially. Uh, and we are eager to gather as many as we can to enjoy our distinguished speakers today. Later on today, the Society's Board of Trustees will meet in our annual meeting to elect new trustees. Please, if you are intending on attending that meeting, you should check your email for logistical instructions. I'm not going to give them, I'll tell you. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I wish also to recognize and thank the Society's annual meeting chair, Laurie Webb Daniel, when it became clear that we were not going to be able to meet in person in the Supreme Court building for the annual lecture. She began immediately to work with our staff to craft today's excellent program and format. So thank you, Laurie. Today's speakers, we are delighted to have Chief Judge Jeffrey Sutton of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and Justice Leandra Kruger of the California Supreme Court, both with highly polished um, careers. They are together today in San Francisco in the Earl Warren Courthouse that is home to the California Supreme Court. Chief Judge Sutton, is going to get a brief introdu introduction as will Justice Kruger. We want to save as much time as we can for our speakers to be heard. Chief Judge Sutton is a graduate of Williams College. He received his JD from the Ohio State University's Moritz School of Law. He clerked for Judge Thomas Meskill on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and then he moved on to clerk for Justice Scalia and Justice Lewis Powell at the Supreme Court. He worked in private practice and he served as Solicitor General for the state of Ohio before being nominated to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit in 2001. He was confirmed in 2003 and he has served as that court's chief judge since 20. 21. Justice Leandra Kruger is a graduate of Harvard and received her JD from Yale. She clerked for Judge David Tatel on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit and then for Justice John Paul Stevens at the Supreme Court of the United States. She worked in private practice and as principal deputy solicitor general of the United States before being nominated to the California Supreme Court in 2014. She was confirmed in 2015. Today, Chief Judge Sutton and Justice Kruger will be talking about the Chief Judge's recent book entitled, Who Decides? States as Laboratory, State Courts as Laboratories of Constitutional Experimentation. As in previous lectures, we will be allowing questions and comments from our audience. If you have something to say, uh, you may convey it by using the Q&A feature on your Zoom connection. The Society's Executive Director, Jim Duff, will share as many as possible um, of those comments with Chief Judge Sutton and Justice Kruger towards the end of the lecture so long as we have a little time left. Chief Judge Sutton and Justice Kruger, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you two fine folks. And we wanna thank you for um, donating your time, your energy uh, and your knowledge. We look forward 
to an exciting lecture. It's all yours. Terrific. Thank you very much for that uh, kind and, and warm introduction. We're here to have a conversation about two books that Chief Judge Sutton has written uh, in which the U.S. Supreme Court plays an important but secondary role. The, the star of uh, the work that Chief Judge Sutton has done over the course of the last several years is actually uh, courts like the one we're now sitting in, uh, the California Supreme Court, other state courts, and indeed other actors responsible for the elaboration and development of state constitutions as opposed to the federal constitution. I think one way to begin this conversation is by asking what is perhaps the obvious question here, which is how does a federal judge like you come to write not one, but two books about state constitutions? Yes, well, well first of all, thank you, uh, Leandra, for doing this interview with me and for hosting me in the California Supreme Court. And thank you, Jim, uh, for the Historical Society sponsoring the talk. It's really great to be with you all. Um, well, I can deepen the mystery. Um, I just finished my 19th year on the federal courts and I never get state constitutional law issues. I mean, maybe I've had two or three over 19 years. So why would I be interested in it? Um, well, like most people um, listening and most people that go to American law schools, uh, they have a course offering called constitutional law. They had that at Ohio State. And it taught half the story. It taught the story about the federal constitution, U.S. Supreme Court decisions construing that constitution, but did not tell the side of the story about the state courts and state constitutions. And I think that's been pretty normal in American law schools for several decades, if not you know, 60, 70 years. I learned um, in kind of a stark way the significance of state constitutions when I became the Ohio Solicitor General in the mid-90s. It fell to me to defend the state in cases in the Ohio Supreme Court. And I, um, I tell my students, it's in my state kind of law classes that I could teach a semester long class based solely on cases I lost in the Ohio Supreme Court under the Ohio Constitution. And these were not inconsequential cases, um, school funding, vouchers, tort reform, criminal procedure. And I found myself just so struck by how significant the state constitution was in resolving these highly salient disputes for the people of the state of Ohio. The second feature of that um, experience was not just learning there was a second shot um, that one could take to defeat a state or local law, but learning that um, the story we tell ourselves about constitutional law in this country is maybe a little bit one-sided and maybe falls into the trap of the peril of the single story. Um, and the story, the narrative, if you will, is um, US Supreme Court being kind of the hero in solving this or that problem and the states in general and state courts in particular, sometimes being the villains of these stories, not realizing the need for equality in a given area, not appreciating a criminal procedure right here or there. And, my experience in working for state government really convinced me that um, you know, the states can be reliable, reliable protectors of rights. Um, and at a minimum, we ought to take seriously both sides of the story that it, it you know, it's, it's um, single stories uh, lead to myths. And you know, one myth is that you know, the federal courts, including my court are always right. That's just not true. Uh, the other myth is that the state courts are invariably wrong, and that also is not true. So to me, one thing that's wonderful about state courts and state constitutions is they allow us, via American federalism, to see both sides of the story. And I guess the last point that um, has led to some convictions in this area is I'm a federal judge. I, I really enjoy interpreting the federal constitution. That means a lot to me. Um, it turns out the source code for the federal constitution is almost exclusively the original state constitutions. Um, according to Gordon Wood, the greatest era of constitution writing in this country, indeed in world history, is the 10 year period roughly from 1776 to 1786, all before the summer of Philadelphia in 1787. And by the time you get to Philadelphia, the states have had a decade of experimentation. Some states, such as Pennsylvania, have had more than one constitutional convention. 
And they've really done a lot of experimentation with separation of powers, individual rights. And that's very helpful when it comes time to frame the federal constitution. It's very helpful when it comes time to frame the bill of rights. And so anyone that does care deeply about the federal constitution ought to pay attention to this source code because that is where our structure comes from. That is where our rights come from. So I think this sort of leads naturally into um, my next question, which is, is why uh, focus on state constitutions now? Uh, as, you, as you say, state constitutions are not a new phenomenon. It's a uh, federal constitution and state constitutional guarantees living alongside one another, um, also not a new phenomenon. What uh, is the impetus for delving more deeply into the relationship between the two at this particular moment in our constitutional history? Yeah, why now? Um, well, you know, I, I, uh, I haven't done a lot of research on this, uh, but, you know, I, I have gone back and looked at American, they're called American constitutional law treatises. And if you look at the first 150 years of our history, um, you'll see that Basically, uh, most constitutional law was state constitutional law, not federal. Almost all of the rights cases were state constitutional cases. And so one of the strange things about this is we initially paid a lot of attention to state constitutions and somehow that changed. And so the question is why? And I think one thing that probably has had a real um, significant impact on on the first, the lack of development of state constitutional law and now its growth is the, you know, the 1950s and 1960s. Um, the Warren Court uh, was clearly on a mission to bring Jim Crow to heel. Um, that led to a lot of innovation um, in criminal procedure, equal protection, even substantive due process rights at the U.S. Supreme Court. And so what ends up happening during the Warren Court is you first of all have a more muscular interpretation of the federal constitution. So that becomes a pretty significant game in town if you're a lawyer with a client who has a problem. And most clients would prefer a national solution to a local one anyway. So that kind of creates more impetus for these federal constitutional rights. But the second thing, which is just as significant, it's during that era when we incorporate most of the Bill of Rights provisions, almost every one of them at this point, now apply to the states. So it's only in the 1950s and 60s and recent decades that someone who's unhappy with a state or local law, a state or local criminal prosecution has two sources of protection, not one. So that's a, that's a relatively recent phenomenon in American legal history, you know, really roughly the last 50, 60 years. So it's only the last 50, 60 years that you could think about using a state and federal constitution to protect a right but then the second thing that I guess it's really the third at this point is, you know, today's court. And I guess I would say the same thing about the Burger Court and um, the Rehnquist Court. It's, it's not the Warren Court. It's, uh, it's not as likely to innovate new rights. Um, it's not the only game in town. Um, one way to illustrate that point would be the, um, the Rucho decision from a few terms ago. And that's a really significant um, issue. The question was whether extreme partisan gerrymandering um, could be regulated, essentially restricted through um, a claim under the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution. The court had been struggling, the US Supreme Court that is, had been struggling for close to two decades trying to figure out if there were identifiable principles by which extreme partisan gerrymandering could be limited. And in root show, the court in a very close decision, 5-4, puts up a red stop sign and says, you know, the 14th Amendment does not apply, at least at this point. And that shifts the spotlight to the states, whether it's state constitutional amendments, state court decisions, legislation, and there actually has been a lot of activity in three short years. Uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, North Carolina, Florida Supreme Court decisions, and, and lots of activity when it comes to state constitutional amendments. Um, this, something similar has happened in some areas of criminal procedure. Um, Map versus Ohio is a 1961, highly consequential US Supreme Court decision where they nationalized the exclusionary rule. Um, that seems like a real benefit to criminal defendants, and of course it is. But since then, um, including a decision in 1984 in Leon, the 
the court has created exceptions to the exclusionary rule. Um, the Leon good faith exceptions are really good example. And so what happens in states that decide, you know, they don't care for that particular exception? Well, almost half of the states have rejected Leon good faith. So they've, they've decided under their state constitution search and seizure guarantee that they can fill what they perceive as a gap left by US Supreme Court decisions. Um, I guess I would say through it all, um, you know, some of these debates, you know, to give be fair to the state and federal courts are very difficult debates. Um, and one, it takes a lot of hubris to say you've got a corner on the market on truth when it comes to some of these just excruciatingly difficult debates. And what that leaves us with right now is a world in which there's a lot of room for state experimentation while there, there of course is room for federal experimentation and perhaps a little more of um, a view at the federal courts to you know, pay attention to these state exper experiments and sometimes use the results of them to decide when to nationalize this right or another right. So in, in your first book, 51 Imperfect Solutions, you um, sort of entered this, this question of the dynamic and the interrelationship between state constitutional law and federal constitutional law as elaborated by the US Supreme Court through a series of um, kind of constitutional law stories. Um, and two of those stories, I think, um, sort of uh, demonstrate different dimensions of how this relationship works. On the one hand, you have uh, the story of what happened after the US Supreme Court's 1973 decision in a case called San Antonio Independent School District versus Rodriguez. Um, and then you go back several decades earlier and talk about the different experience um, uh, of the, the relationship between the US Supreme Court's decision in Buck versus Bell and what happened in, in uh, state courts and state legislatures, both before and after. What um, can you tell us about those two constitutional law stories and what they tell us about the development of an American constitutional law? Yeah, so the Rodriguez story is, um, it's such a significant case in uh, US Supreme Court history. It's March of 1973, uh, so, um, it's the Burger Court, but I would say it's in a transition. There's been four Nixon appointees. And Rodriguez, you can argue, is the bookend case to Brown. Um, so Brown versus Board of Education famously eliminates de jure limit, you know, limitations on going to a public school based on race. And, you know, and Justice Marshall's the winning advocate. Justice Marshall's now on the court when it comes time for Rodriguez. And the question is how... What, what is Brown delivering if we still live in a world or a country in which we still have segregated housing, which leads not, not by law, but in fact, and that leads to this uncomfortable realization that while we've eliminated segregation by law through Brown, we still have a world in which some public schools are more equal than others. Some public schools have a lot more money, revenue, resources to contribute to this education and you know this fundamental question is this really the equality we were looking for after brown and in a you know just a very difficult decision it's five four justice powell writes the majority justice marshall writes an anguished dissent um it's it's a, it's a very significant case and it looks frankly like a very significant defeat um if we're if we're going to have barriers to unequal education based on wealth how much have we really accomplished if we've also gotten rid of barriers to equal education based on race, um, particularly in a country where there still is residential patterns of you know, segregation. So Rodriguez looks like a, a really unfortunate defeat for the, the, the cause of equality in education. It's in 1973. And what's really fascinating about the story after 1973 is three quarters of the, well, it's, it's really more than that. It's about 45 of the 50 states have school funding cases where they're challenging the same problem that was at issue in Rodriguez, saying it's just not right that this poor school district, you know, has to compete with this really wealthy suburb. How can they both offer similar similar educational, um, at, you know, opportunities when there's such a difference in wealth between the two communities? 
And in one state court case after another, they invoke the state constitutions, not the federal. They can't do that after Rodriguez. And they use the state constitutional um, equal protection clauses, but more often they're thorough and efficient clauses to mandate more equality and funding between and among rich, middle-class, poor, more poor school districts. Now, you know, no one's gonna say problem solved, mission accomplished, but what is interesting about the story is the state courts really fill a lot of the gaps left by the Rodriguez decision. In fact, the provocative question raised by that chapter of the book is, did the Rodriguez plaintiffs win by losing? Now, obviously they lost and these changes didn't take place for quite a while, but keep in mind, Rodriguez comes out of San Antonio and Texas and one of the state court decisions that rejects Rodriguez, uses its state constitution to provide more equality in education is the Texas Supreme Court. So quite often states that won cases in the, fed, you know, the federal court system go on to lose them in the state court system under a state guarantee. And the other nice thing about these cases is they're all different. Um, every state has different problems when it comes to equality and opportunity and equalizing funding between school districts. And the thing that a state court can do that the US Supreme Court cannot do is both customize the right and the remedy to the circumstances facing that particular state, their culture, their history, their politics. And that's just something, you know, the US Supreme Court is, is kind of stuck with. They've got to issue a ruling for the whole country. And, you know, one possibility, even if Rodriguez come out the other way is they would have had trouble with remedy issues. Um, and state courts had a lot more latitude in the remedy issues. And so anyway, it, it's a story that shows it's a little complicated to assume the US Supreme Court is gonna be the exclusive guardian of individual rights in particular, or say um, equality more generally. The Buck versus Bell story is slightly different story. Um, that's one where, you know, Rodriguez was 5-4 and I think you'd have a pretty healthy debate among a lot of con law experts today about whether it was right or wrong. It would be, a, I think, a close debate as reflected in the 5-4 decision. Well, Buck versus Bell is a different type of case. Uh, it's very hard to find defenders of um, Justice Holmes' opinion. Even Justice Holmes has a bad, had a bad day. Um, it's an 8-1 decision. And the issue in the case is whether um, eugenics legislation is permissible. And this was, a, I guess, a fad, happily a temporary movement in American society where the idea was to and voluntarily sterilize individuals that were called feeble-minded. This was a term that covered a lot of perceived problems that an individual would have, whether mental, physical, you know, you name it. it it's, it's not a happy chapter in American history. And um, in Buck versus Bell, Justice Holmes disposes of this claim with, you know, three paragraphs um, and says that the 14th Amendment has no role to play when it comes to laws that force the sterilization of men and women with these various difficulties or sometimes with criminal convictions. So that's clearly a story that proves um, the court is not always in the right. Um, you, you put all your marbles in one basket, you'll eventually be, di be disappointed. And that of course is what happens with Buck versus Bell. But the other part of the story that I think most people didn't appreciate is that the state courts had faced these same issues and in six out of the seven cases actually got it right, often under their state constitutions. So I, I feel like that's a, it's a nice corrective to the idea that state courts, even state courts with elected judges can sometimes be the best guardians of liberty inequality. And I mean, one question for the two of us, Justice Kruger, is figuring out when it is the state courts are going to get it right, and and when it when is it that you know we can't trust them, um, or or should be skeptical? Maybe is a better way of putting it. But the Buck versus Bell story is really a wonderful story of showing it's fundamentally very complicated uh, because that was um, very much an individual rights issue. Um, the verdict of history is clearly shown the state courts were right about that, the U.S. Supreme Court wrong, and it's just a nice reminder that it's complicated as to whether you look in one place or the other or do as I think we should do is look in both places for uh, protection.
So one of the things that I think is, is really interesting about the story that you tell in your book about Buck versus Bell is how the verdict of history ultimately came to be delivered. And it was, as you say, there was you know, some early disagreement between the state courts and the United States Supreme Court about the permissibility of laws like the one that was upheld in Buck versus Bell. But ultimately, the story comes to an end decades later, not so much because of the courts, but because of other actors in the system, which I think sort of sometimes tends to complicate our very court-centric view of, of how constitutional law unfolds. Yeah, if I had one uh, slight complaint about American uh, government and our, our civics debates, it's that we are so focused on what is decided rather than who should make the decision. And sometimes it's, it's actually really profitable to think through the different decision makers. Um, obviously it's state and federal courts are two options, but the Buck versus Bell story, you're quite right. Um, the other heroes of that story are not judges, uh, they're legislators uh, that decide not to pass eugenics laws. They're governors that veto proposed eugenics laws and their executive branch officials, the superintendents of the so-called institutions who refuse to impose these involuntary sterilizations on the patients in the, at, you know, at their healthcare facility. And I, you know, I, I, I sometimes think we're so, you know, this is a US Supreme Court Historical Society lecture, so I don't wanna you know, you know, say we should not focus on courts or not pay attention to courts. Of course, I think that's very important. And the two of us have dedicated our most of our public lives to serving in the court system, but it is dangerous to think of um, American government in too court centric a way or too constitution specific a way. Um, you know, you can illustrate the point, you know, take, take Brown, uh, you know, our, our greatest Supreme Court decision. I mean, you know, talk about a great story. The, the national court using the 14th Amendment finally to bring Jim Crow to heal or largely to heal. And, you know, who can complain about that? You know, it just doesn't get much better than that. Well, I, I, I can say maybe it can get better than that. Um, you know, Brown is of course a tragedy because Brown's a tragedy in the sense it had to correct Plessy. It's a tragedy that it took so long to correct Plessy. And let's remember another way in which we can look after rights protection um, and being sensitive to minority groups of one sort or another in society. And that's to ask yourself the value of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. I mean, arguably that's, that's the great story, um, maybe the greatest story. Here we have a situation in which the majority process, elected officials have decided that it's very important as a matter of our legal political, social culture for the majority to look after the uh, rights of minorities, dissenting voices, minority faiths, um, whatever it might be, and you know, using the majority process for good. And so, yes, I do think sometimes we focus a little too much on what the bottom line is, are we happy with it or not, as opposed to whether the right decision makers involved and sometimes can there be even a better decision maker? Um, I think you and I would both agree it is a failure when the courts have to come in, right? Something went wrong when the courts have to come in and we should not, we have a role to play and thank God we're there, um, but we shouldn't always assume that's the best way to fix a problem. And sometimes it's actually quite unfortunate that the courts have to fix the problem. It'd be way better to have more 1964 Civil Rights Act, whether at the federal or state level. Do you see this as a, as a um an important difference between the way that um, federal constitutional law is done and state constitutional law is done. Um, this is sort of this question of who decides and whether constitutional law is primarily the domain of the courts or whether it is also um, a domain that is that's shared by other actors. I think a danger of the court-centric approach in focusing so much on judicially enforceable rights is to lose track of the fact that it's a constitution for all of us. It's a constitution that people ratified. It's a constitution that the people should care about. They should care about these, uh, these values when they're deciding whom to vote for. 
um, for executive branch officials, legislative officials, you name it. So I, I, um, I, I, do, I do think there's room for improvement there. Um, you know, I don't think there's been a country in world history that embraces judicially enforceable rights more than we do. Now, maybe it's a function of some intractable problems that we really needed courts to help sort out. Um, and, you know, fair enough, um, it, it's worked before. Do I think it's a long-term strategy? Um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about that. I, I'm certainly skeptical of thinking of one court always being the guardian. I mean, that's the Buck versus Bell story. No court's gonna be perfect throughout history. So at a minimum, if we're gonna stay in a court-centric mode, I'm very much a fan of you know, spreading responsibility among the 51 state high courts, the 51 constitutions. In fact, I sometimes worry that we Americans ask a little too much of the federal courts in general and the US Supreme Court in particular, that um, you know, it's, it's a lot to expect of one court to resolve every single intense policy debate. And if we're gonna rely on judicial enforceable rights, maybe we ought to spread a little responsibility among the state courts. I mean, think of the Brandeis model of, um, Brandeis said you could, you know, a brave state could experiment with a new social problem by trying an experiment in this or that area. Now, what Brandeis was referring to was state legislatures as the labs that, that ought to stop and make us think right there, right? He thought of legislatures as the key policy makers. He thought it would be state legislatures that would in innovate these ideas. And if there was a winning insight, sure enough, Congress could nationalize it. And if competing winning insights appeared or there's lots of legitimate ways to do it that the state's legislatures could chart their own paths. I'm not sure I wonder why um, we can't use the exact same Brandeis model with the development of um, state and federal constitutional rights, uh, particularly ones that are inevitable, you know, substantive due process, you know, what speech is, you know, when is, when is, when is process due, what processes do, when is a search unreasonable, when is speech free? I mean, those are really general words to deal with a lot of very difficult debates. And why not use the Brandeis model of brave state courts being the first responders, innovators when it comes to new conflicts between government and individuals uh, between security and liberty. Um, so yeah, I, I, do, I do think there's quite a few ways to think about this today that are citizens taking seriously constitutional values and perhaps shifting the way we identify new constitutional rights. So your latest book, Who Decides, um, sort of shifts focus from um, the development of individual rights protections under different heads of constitutional law to questions about structure, including um, the sort of the power of judicial review, which is a kind of, I think, a fundamental piece of how we allocate decision-making responsibility in, in, uh, in our constitutional system. Um, you spend the first uh, several chapters uh, of, of this second book um, tracing the origins of, of judicial review, and that may be an issue that's of particular interest to, to this group with the, the historical society. Can you talk a little bit about um, what, uh, what you discovered there and what role state courts played in, in this development? Well, I, in truth, I was surprised by the role of, of the state courts in developing judicial review. And my conclusion is that had John Marshall never been born, had there never been an election of 1800, had there never been a Marbury or Madison, we still would have had judicial review in this country. And the reason I can say that with a lot of conviction is before the federal constitution was ratified, the state courts were already engaged in judicial review. So you have state court cases from Rhode Island, North Carolina, Virginia, where they're they're actually overruling a state legislation or executive branch orders based on their state constitutions. And one of the things that was interesting to me about it is um, they thought it was part of your oath, really a duty to engage in judicial review. And their take was that they had an obligation to apply the right law to the case at hand. And if they're, you know, the state court judges were not unfamiliar with the conflict of laws. 
that happened all the time. And in the English common law, there were also superior and inferior laws. So that concept, even though the English constitution is famously unwritten, they did have an, an, the notion of superior and inferior laws. So the state court judges did not consider it unusual to decide they had to apply the superior law to the case at hand, the superior law being the constitution. In fact, they said they'd be violating their oath if they didn't do that in a given case. So that, that proves judicial review was something that when we created the federal constitution and the judicial power, it came with the concept that federal judges could do what state court judges were already doing. But there is another feature of this that I think is important. And that's that they were reluctant to invalidate democratically enacted laws. And they engaged in, um, they used all kinds of tools to avoid the conflict between the superior constitution and the inferior statute. Uh, the most prominent of which was constitutional avoidance. Um, you know, they didn't think you could, you know, say yes was no, um, but, but they did think you could be aggressive in construing a statute to avoid the conflict with the constitution. So I feel like the lesson's actually a pretty healthy lesson for federal judges today. Um, that yes, there's, we shouldn't be debating judicial review. That's, clearly what was expected at the founding, but we might borrow a page from the state court judges and early federal judges that for the most part were, were careful about when they exercised it. Um, because when they did exercise it, there was controversy. I mean, uh, the Rhode Island legislature did not like it when some Rhode Island state court judges invalidated their handiwork. In fact, those were they, those state court judges, you're not gonna like this, Justice Kruger, those state court judges had one year terms and four of the five, four of the five of them were not reappointed the next time around. <laughs> so uh, it, it does show that even though they weren't hesitant to exercise judicial review, it didn't necessarily make elected officials happy. Well, I will say that that story does make me appreciate the fact that on the California Supreme Court, we have 12 year terms. It may not be Article three, life tenure, salary protection, but 12 years definitely beats, beats one. Um, we are uh, just a few minutes away from opening up the floor to questions. So for um, those members of the audience who have um, burning questions, this would be a good time to start entering them into the, um, the chat box. In the meantime, I wanted to, um, to ask you to just sort of zoom out for a moment and compare um, in a sort of at a macro level um, how federal constitutional law um, differs from state constitutional law as a, as a structural matter. How are these questions about who decides, how power is allocated, how decisions are made, how do they differ in the federal context versus the state context? Yeah, this was another uh, surprising, you know, real, realization as I was doing this work. The um, uh, let me start by just comparing the federal and state constitutions more generally and then focused on the court systems. So the federal constitution is largely, um, I, would, I don't want to say stuck in the pejorative sense, but it, it's still very much an 18th century document. It's got many Republican features. It's very non-democratic in lots of ways. Um, think electoral college, think of two senators per state. Judicial review, when exercised in a, a significant way, is, can be very non-democratic. And, and the federal constitution is very hard to amend. It takes three quarters of the states to ratify an amendment. So the Bill of Rights are quickly passed, arguably as a quid pro quo for ratification. Since then, we have 17 amendments, uh, two are awash for prohibition, against prohibition. So we're, we're talking 15 amendments in a very long time, and some of them very technical. And so, you know, dealing with change is a very significant issue for our constitution. How do you deal with norm shifting? How do you deal with identifications of mistakes in the original constitution? And the federal constitution, because of the article five, three quarters ratification requirement is very difficult to change. And so our federal government is very much in a Republican, sometimes quite non-democratic mode. The trend line at the state level, it's like this growth stock. It just goes up and up and up in terms of more democratic. It just gets more democratic at every chapter in American history. So they decide, 
in Jacksonian population, the populism, they spread the vote to more people. Soon the executive branch starts getting divided into more and more folks. You can have a governor, a lieutenant governor, a secretary of state, an attorney general. So we now have plural executives. They start electing state court judges. So 90% of state court judges today are elected. And then they get the initiative, which you know from California, I know from Ohio, half the states have some form of direct democracy, whether with respect to statutes or initiatives, it doesn't get any more de democratic than giving the people the right to um, amend the constitution on their own. So this trend line of more and more democratic states has also led to more democratic state courts because the other thing is the state constitutions largely can be amended just by a 51% vote. With ease of amendment comes high volume of amendments, lots of convention, conventions. I mean, the federal constitution, I think maybe the number of words is in the 7,500 range. And I think the state constitutions average out at 34,000 words. That's really, really, really different. So where does that leave me in comparing the roles of the federal and state courts? Um, I, think you've, I think we've got to pay attention to one feature of the federal courts that is really quite consequential. Um, it's a court that has exercised judicial review throughout American history in a way that is about as aggressive as any court in history, but it's interpreting a document that is as difficult to correct as any constitution in history. So that's a, that's a very, that's a very tricky proposition. Um, at the same time, the state courts, there's a lot more mechanisms to correct state courts that have either gone rogue or for whatever reason have gotten out ahead of their state because if the people don't care for a state court decision, it's a little easier to fix the problem because you can amend the constitution with a 51% vote if the people of a state feel the state court judges aren't reflecting their culture, their history, their politics, 90% of them have elections. There's only one state that has life tenure, that's Rhode Island. Um, the smallest state is the one that's most like the federal model when it comes to tenure protections. So that leaves me to say the two shots are really complement each other. It's, it's, it's really nice to think of state court judges in a very democratic environment, being the most likely to be first responders to new problems, the most innovative, the experimenters in chief, if you will, because the risks are lower. It's, it's just one state if it, the experiment goes awry. And if the people are really unhappy, they have, they have a response. Um, if, you've, if you focus too much energy into the winner take all, nationalizing constitutional rights too quickly, you, you do run into the risk of a court getting out, out ahead of the people and construing a document that's very hard to amend. Um, and you know that's and then of course the composition of the court is hard to change as well given life tenures. So it does make me think that um, Brandeis has a very good insight for legislatures that also applies to state courts. And you know I'm all for both shots and I, I think, one way to think about this is it be, it's very valuable for the federal courts to be paying attention to these experiments at the state court level and sometimes using the input from those experiments to decide when it's, it's appropriate or right to nationalize a new constitutional right. Great. So I think with that, um, Jim it may pop in at this moment to, um, to share some questions from our virtual audience. Thank you very much, Justice Kruger, and thank you, Chief Judge Sutton. I, we, we're getting uh, a lot of questions, and it's a very stimulating discussion. I, I hesitate to interrupt, uh, but we do want to uh, share uh, the, the forum with uh, our audience, and it's uh, uh, just a, a tribute to the, uh, how, how much uh, your conversation has stimulated interest. Here, here's the first uh, question. I'll pick from a lot, uh, which sort of, it feeds off of exactly wh where you were ending up, uh, Chief Judge Sutton, and that is, uh, are you urging federal courts to abstain on some federal constitutional claims and leave them for state courts to decide, or only 
to hesitate to uphold some new federal constitutional claims because of the availability of state courts? Or is it uh, something else that you're um, uh, advocating? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. So, you know, I think, and I think the answer is going to be really context specific. Um, Federal judge takes an oath to enforce the federal constitution. And I think when the federal constitution speaks to a problem, uh, clearly it prohibits a state, for example, from enacting a law in a certain area. I don't think there is any role for abstention. I mean, you've got, um, as long as it's a case or controversy, you've got standing. Um, I think we not only um, should hear, I mean, we have an obligation to hear it and we have an obligation to protect that right in a national way. I think the area where I find there's room for more dialogue between the state and federal courts, and I'm not sure I'd use the word abstention, but maybe occasionally patience, is I think the room for dialogue exists where it's really unclear whether the federal document speaks to the problem. That's that's where I think has been really challenging sometimes. And I think sometimes that's what leads to uh, resentment to the losing parties. Um, So consider a doctrine like substantive due process, which you know is very hard to get your, your arms around in terms of knowing exactly where it begins and ends. But you know, I'm a lower court judge, we have substantive due process, uh, no doubt. And as long as we have it, we have an obligation to enforce it. Now, it's possible that substantive due process identification of new rights might be the kind of area where it does make sense for the US Supreme Court to you know, exercise some patience before it decides whether to rule on the issue and before it decides whether to nationalize if it chooses to go down that road. Um, you know, One problem for the federal courts and one very strong objection a federal judge would make to my books is they would say, Jeff, <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. There are uh, you know, 330 million people they're bound to be somebody unhappy with a law on a given day. And if they file a federal case, we have to hear it. Uh, how do we deal with that? And one answer is, you know, the US Supreme Court is at the top of the hierarchy. Um, they don't have mandatory appellate jurisdiction over that many areas. So they can exercise their discretion with the cert docket in deciding when it's appropriate to deal with this new issue. But I, do, I, I really do think there's a lot to be said for uh, paying attention to the state input. I mean, you could argue the whole story of the Baker from 1972 or so until Obergefell in 2015. I mean, that's a long story, but that's a story where the US Supreme Court put up a big red stop sign. And then in the following decades, all the experimentation took place in the States before Obergefell when the court ultimately nationalized that right to marriage equality. So. That's an example where it probably made some sense for them to be patient um, is probably because they, it allowed them to get a lot of input from the states, whatever one thinks of the decision. And again, my books are neutral on this. I, you know, it's, it's a for better or worse situation. This can make you happy as much as it can make you sad. But I do think as a matter of process, it doesn't hurt to get input from more sources. Um, similar question uh, in deciding issues differently from the US Supreme Court, how can state Supreme Courts avoid the perception that they are driven by preferred policy outcomes, especially when the language of the state and federal constitutions are similar? Uh, And is there, I'll just add to this question, uh, uh, is there a difference between the, uh, the, the two court systems in that regard. I mean, you've used the term experimentation or laboratories for experimentation at the state court level, and Justice Kruger can speak to this as well if she likes, but uh, whether state courts perceive themselves uh, that way. So I'll, I'll combine a question that I had with one from uh, the audience and uh, throw it out there to the both of you. Yeah, I mean, there's... there's uh, um, a, a lot in that question, it's, it's, it's really, really significant. Um, the first place to look is just remember the rights that we're debating, due process, search and seizure, free speech, free exercise, all originate in state constitutions. So the very best source for evidence of what they meant would be the state debates 
the state courts construing them. So I would, I would actually worry about federal courts imitating states than the reverse. In other words, <laughs> states were the first game in town, the state provisions the first game in town. But now let's just shift to today, 2022. The U.S. Supreme Court has said something. And now the question is whether a state court should broaden its interpretation, even of identical words. Well, one very good explanation for taking a different path is something Justice Kruger and I would both agree about. Um, methods of a constitutional interpretation are really important to appellate judges, right? And we know we have a world where there's some that focus more on originalism, some more pragmatic, some more living constitutionalists. If I were a state court judge and the US Supreme Court decision that's on the table used a different method of interpretation from the one I espouse, I would think it was presumptively wrong. That's not result driven. That would be very much honoring my method of interpretation and vice versa. I mean, Justice Kruger, I mean, if I could only serve with Justice Kruger for the rest of my life, I would be so happy. But think about our two bosses, Justice Stevens and Justice Scalia. They did embrace different methods of interpretation. So someone that preferred the Justice Stevens approach, and they're on a state court, and the U.S. Supreme Court decision was written by Justice Scalia. Now, they're going to respect it for sure, but they might decide that's not the same method I embrace. So I think methods of interpretation can be a really highly legitimate reason. And my, my last point just goes to something I said earlier, the customizing point. The one weakness, or not weakness, but impediment the U.S. Supreme Court has is they really cannot customize interpretations of national guarantees to deal with different regions, different population groups. They're interpreting a constitution for 51 jurisdictions, thousands of cities, 330 million people. There is nothing wrong with the California Supreme Court or the Ohio Supreme Court taking a very difficult issue and customizing their interpretation to pay attention to their history. Um, take the states of Utah, Rhode Island, um, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. All four of those states were founded by religious dissenters. All right, so they, the, the premise of their founding was we are a minority faith and we'd like to have a place where that minority faith is respected. Surely the state courts from those states are gonna pay attention to that history when it comes to free exercise protection and surely they're gonna pay attention to it in a way the US Supreme Court could not. It couldn't in, embrace an interpretation of the free exercise clause solely for the experiences of the people of Utah. That's, 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 that's a customizing function. They, they just don't have authority to use. So there's a lot there. It's a great question. And I, you know, I hope that gives some of the answer. If, if I could just- Yes, please. Just very briefly, I think it, I think part of the answer to the question is sort of uh, harkens back to some themes that we've heard already during this hour, which is there is a, an incredible amount of variation um, among state constitutions versus the federal constitution, even in cases where there is parallel text that appears to protect a sort of similar right in both state and federal constitutions. What you discover in a state like mine, where uh, the constitution um, can and frequently is amended, is that there's often you know, sort of additional guidance um, that, is, that is, is codified as part of the constitution um, that informs the way that, that those state court judges are going to interpret the text. And there often are um, historical um, differences in practice and understandings of how these provisions um, work that develop over time that will necessarily um, you know, position our court in a slightly different place from another court that doesn't have that, that same history, doesn't have that additional um, guidance to, to look to. So it's just to suggest that there are sort of real differences between the text and history mm -hmm. and as practice with respect to a number of these guarantees that do necessarily inform the different ways that state courts come at answering some of these questions. Very interesting. And I assume that California's constitution is more easily amended than the U.S. constitution and, and you have many, many more amendments to it, as you mentioned. 
I think that that's fair to say. <laughs> sit down and compare the size of the California Constitution to the size of the US Constitution, you can see sort of some graphical evidence of, of just that difference. So Ch Chief Justice George, who used to, he was used to be the Chief Justice on the California Supreme Court, used to say that Justice Black on the US Supreme Court could bring a, a copy of the Constitution in his pocket and take it wherever he went. And Chief Justice George said, if I adopted the same practice with the California constitution, I'd have to get a very thick backpack. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good example. Uh, you speak of uh, how the state constitutions can and should inform the preservation of rights, bottom up, if you will. I wonder if you can speak to the mood of federal courts to intervene when a question arises, alleging a violation of a state comp, uh, constitution, perhaps top down. We do get claims where someone goes to federal court and says the state is violating its own constitution. We don't get a lot of those cases because um, there's some immunity, sovereign immunity issues. So they usually come up more in cases involving cities. Um, so that, that does happen. Now, the question I might be asking a slightly different, or there's another way to think of that question. And that's when the state constitution doesn't, uh, the question is whether it means the same as the federal constitution, but perhaps it violates still another federal guarantee. So that comes up a little in voting rights cases. And that's been kind of a new area where you have state courts um, looking very carefully at voting rights issues with respect to elections. And then the question is whether that's say var violating something in article one of the US constitution. And, that's a tricky issue. In fact, it's one I might well get. So I probably will just say nothing more than it can be a tricky <laughs> issue. But obviously, we have to pay attention to both. Um, when they're both properly in front of us, I can't just uh, honor the state constitution if the party in front of me is claiming that that interpretation separately violates another pr provision of the federal constitution. I can't ignore that. Um, but that has led, particularly in the voting rights and free, you know, kind of the religion clause area, those two areas have led to a lot of that type of problem. We have uh, quite a few other questions. I'm afraid we're not going to be able to get to them all. I'll, I'll uh, go through this one with you and uh, let's see where we are time-wise, but uh, we know how busy the two of you are and want to respect that, your time. But I, I can assure you that our, we could be here the rest of the afternoon with the, it's, it's a fascinating discussion and we're grateful to you both. Uh, in state court cases, uh, I'm going to read this because I, uh, it's, it's a lengthy question, but uh, there is frequently the doctrine of imperi materia, whereby the similarly worded state constitutional violations are treated the same as Supreme Court precedent, especially after the incorporation of most of the Bill of Rights. Assuming this might evolve further, should there be a distinction made in the analysis on expanding civil rights versus reducing civil rights and or cooperative federalism versus antagonistic federalism? And if you understand that question, you'll save us 15 minutes of trying to. <laughs> oh, well, I, I understand it, uh, maybe only in my own mind, but I, I do understand <laughs> it. Um, so this there's a really significant debate that Justice Kruger and I are very aware of, which is when is it appropriate for a state court to take a different path with similar language? And California illustrates this well, because California comes after the federal constitution. And so you might argue um, that, well, if California adopts some provisions in its Declaration of Rights that are word for word the same as the federal document, maybe that means they should get the same interpretation. I think that's what the questioner is getting at. And that's not a terrible argument, um, say, in a case in 1915, you might very well say that the search and seizure guarantee should mean exactly the same thing as what the federal one meant when California became a state. Um, but I don't think it's a very good argument going forward. Um, it's very strange to think that just because a state constitution happens to have language identical to or similar to the federal constitution that the state, the state meant to take a trek with the US Supreme Court wherever it happened to go in the future. I mean, no one takes a, a voyage without, without knowing the destination. And obviously going forward, 
the U.S. Supreme Court might interpret that guarantee in ways that the state court ultimately disagrees with. And that is federalism. There's just nothing wrong with it. Just as Congress can propose a way of dealing with taxing and spending that initially makes sense for a state, a state might decide a few decades later, that is no longer for us. And that's, that's just totally appropriate. And, you know, in an era when the U.S. Supreme Court during the Warren Court was very inventive with identification of new rights, you know, some states were fine to just go along for the ride. That's no problem there. But if a U.S. Supreme Court is not inventing as many rights, but perhaps the people of a state think um, are very sensitive to a given issue, there's just nothing wrong with their state legislature or their state court deciding to fill that gap. I, I, I really feel that's American federalism. There's just nothing wrong in some areas. I mean, we're going to always have the backstop of the U.S. Constitution, but some areas where Ohio can be more protective than California and other areas, California is more protective than Ohio. That's, that's a benefit of federalism, not necessarily a curse. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I have given our time. I think we will end on that note. And I apologize to our audience, uh, those of you whose questions I didn't get to. I'm sorry we didn't get through all of them. But again, it's uh, an indication of how stimulating the discussion was. And I want to thank very much Justice Kruger for her time today and for hosting Chief Judge Sutton and the Earl Warren Courthouse. And uh, we're grateful uh, that you've spent this time with us. I, I want to uh, uh, advise our audience that we have a copy of both of Chief Judge Sutton's book in our uh, society's gift shop, www.supremecourtgifts.org. I'm going to hold up uh, and <laughs> a copy of his book. I uh, encourage you to read it. it it's uh, very well done. And, and, uh, I, and Justice Kruger did a great job of uh, analyzing it and, and uh, succinctly asking questions that brought out the, the gist of, the, of uh, the context of the book. Uh, I encourage you to read it anyway. Uh, don't use these Cliff's notes and uh, <laughs> read the whole thing. <laughs> Um, thank you both. Uh, we're grateful for your time. Thank you for our audience for joining us. I hope we're going to be in person next year at the Supreme Court building for our annual lecture. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, we're so thankful that uh, we've reached a much broader audience today. Uh, thank you both very much. And we are adjourned. Thank you.